Tonight, on History, So It Doesn't Repeat, we feature a philosophical history discussion to identify the root causes of knowledge, reason, and understanding, and discover why the survival tool of philosophy has dwindled toward extinction until now. Learning's the answer. What's the question? Here's your host and navigator, Richard Grove. It's time to study history so it doesn't repeat. Welcome back to History So It Doesn't Repeat. Tonight we begin with some questions. Questions like, what is freedom? What is slavery? Is the response, because I said so, a reason, or the absence of reason? Why is violence an admission of intellectual bankruptcy? Why is irrationality not confronted with evidence, logic, and reason? And if deception were confronted with evidence, logic, and reason, and the audience could not discern between fact and fiction, truth and falsity, what needs to be done to resolve this problem? My observation is that many individuals lack a grasp of something called philosophy and thus fail to fully grasp reality. Has philosophy become obsolete or has it been obscured purposely to disarm the minds of individuals? In order to address the root causes and identify the answers to these very important questions in all of our lives, we're going to take a metaphorical journey through a maze of preliminary questions to identify the answers which lead to learning how to find the answers to everything and all of your questions. Joining me tonight via Skype to aid and assist in this truth-discovering journey, we have with us tonight three superstars of cognitive liberty. From Alabama is Derek Underwood. From Minnesota, we have Melissa Simeon. And once again, from Pennsylvania, we are joined by Tony Myers, all of whom are participants in the Tragedy and Hope online research and development community and have also participated in the various study groups that we've conducted over the past several years into critical thinking and introduction into logical processing of thoughts to ascertain what is and what is not knowledge. I'll begin by asking this question to each of you. What is it that you hope to gain from tonight's conversation? And what is it that you hope to learn that you can take forward in life? I would like for us to develop a roadmap that people can follow to bring the content of their consciousness in line with 3D reality, with existence. Well, for myself, I would like to gain from this um, a review of some of the things I've looked at before and haven't looked at in a long time. And I would like to rein in my tendency to get carried away with abstractions and imagination and thinking things that are real that really aren't real. Excellent. And last but not least, Tony, what, what are your thoughts on what you want to gain from tonight's conversation? Uh, it's definitely in line with both what Derek and Melissa said, uh, but a little bit more in line with the idea of abstractions and kind of getting lost into these sort of idealized worlds in my head and just making sure it actually relates to the physical world and you know, kind of comment on some of the ideas I've confronted with different people that hold some of those conceptions before perceptions, ideas, and whatnot. So to kind of hash out first principles, understand what we're talking about at Tragedy and Hope as far as logic and philosophy and where a lot of these ideas are coming from and, and sort of contrast to what's been presented recently and, you know, to give sort of clarification. All right. So yeah. that's a good uh, opportunity there to break into free form. We at Tragedy and Hope are here not because we enjoy doing these things first and foremost. It's because we found a necessity in our lives to kind of sort out what is actually going on and dismiss the arbitrary and to discover what are the facts of the matter and what are the fictions of the matter and how to dismiss those fictions to get back the truth. So I guess uh, the next question I want to ask is uh, a personal observation. What is a, a problem area in the world where you see tonight's conversation being applicable to being uh, adjacent to the root cause, if not addressing it? Um, I think people have uh, a problem with uh, abstractions, with um, is, is specifically collective abstractions or fictions, they give attributes or characteristics to those abstractions that they don't in reality have. Well, Derek kind of took the words out of my mouth. I would, I would agree. It's the, the things that we take to be entities 
that we're interacting with when they're really just ideas that have no ability to take action on their own. It's disconnecting what, what's a, who and what can take action with just ideas, which are going to just sit there and can be thought about and talked about, but can't interact with us. What do you think, Tony? I very much agree with both what Derek and Melissa said. I'm actually going to go the other route and say uh, I'm kind of interested in hashing out the idea of not only that maybe abstractions themselves don't have any pertinence to the real world, but just this idea of scientism and where we get these sort of hypothetical statements and how they essentially use this to manage us as individuals and how they essentially roll this out to uh, create sort of these collective ideas of how to control us. So it's a nominal or just uh, it's an inductive, taking each specific instance perspective instead of taking these larger abstract universal perspectives. Both of them have their limitations that I'd like to com- you know, kind of hash out and comment on. So Okay, so yeah. uh, I've heard a lot of words said. I've understood many of the words. I'm going to need definitions f- from some of you as we go on. But basically, we're observing that existence exists. We're conscious of it. And now we're having a conversation to deal with some of the contradictions that we haven't yet identified through a conversation, through using inquiry, we might be able to identify and ascertain, you know, positioning so that we can stop philosophizing in midstream, which is what, you know, many of this, the buzzwords that Tony just dropped there are, indic- uh, are indicators of. Uh, this philosophizing midstream and not starting at a tangible point that's objective and shareable and communicable to other people. So um, I guess the, thing, the first thing I would like to do is go through uh, a few questions and if it if it takes us someplace interesting then we can continue down that path and if not then we'll inquire into another area and find something of substance the first question i want to ask is is there an objective reality and if so are you conscious of it yes (laughs) (laughs) what do you think by objective reality do you mean that we're actively engaged in it or part of it or let we create the reality? I mean, that's a really tough sort of question that has a lot of philosophical implications. I mean, is it something that mind molds or something that we go through and discover? You know, do we discover the different, you know, things we perceive in the reality? Does it, it, you know, it's a a really tough sort of question that's been argued about for 2,000 plus years. It really shouldn't be tough. It's really super commonsensical. That's very common to us and all our senses, but... Well, it's I would assume that by asking, idea. I would assume that by asking questions, we are also assuming that uh, there can be answers. Otherwise, we wouldn't bother asking questions. So let me just take this route. If uh, if you mentioned that reality could be con- you know consciously created by the mind, I would like to choose that route because then I wouldn't create so many problems and technical hiccups for myself. Can we go that route? Is it logically hold? Does it logically hold up? Uh, or are there contradictions that can be readily apparent and dismissed? Well, it sounds like the primacy of consciousness to me. Well, but why can't we it, have that? I would like primacy of consciousness because then I would never need to fill my cup. I could just imagine more water being in here and we could just go forward. But reality or existence is what it is independent of any consciousness. How do we uh, yeah, know I, that? How do we know that? Is there any evidence of that? I would say the evidence exists uh, in the real limitations you are you bump up against. You're having technical hiccups because there are limitations to the specific things you're trying to use, perhaps in the wrong way. I don't know. (laughs) There's a a limitation on that cup getting full, and it it requires somebody to actually fill it. Uh, There, you know, there are real limitations in reality. So I don't think that imagination will get us everywhere we need to go. Well, Einstein said that imagination is more important than knowledge, and a lot of people take that as imagination trumps knowledge, but I really think what he's saying is for true knowledge to come about, it has to start with imagination and curiosity and move into a structured process of inquiry that actually identifies that which exists. And we, you know, we're, thus far we're using this thing called words, this technology called words, to describe what exists, and yet we're also describing a problem where through ambiguity, equivocation, other fallacious and, uh, you know, what are, what are fallacies but uh, incorrect methods of logically thinking. All these things are permeating our environment, and we, we see those things and we say, well, that's a problem when it takes place over here or over here. But noticing that the root cause is that most people don't know how to start from a, an axiom 
and philosophize their way down to actually finding truth, that knowledge, has to start with the inspiration and imagination. So not using Im Im inspiration or imagination for a source of knowledge, but rather the starting point, the igniting point to curiosity that then leads through a habit of actions that bring you consistent results. So I want to go back and ask the question, a very, what would seem basic question, but it's a, an essential question to what it means to be human as what makes us human as our minds. Why do human beings use words? Can anyone tell me why we use words? To communicate common needs, but first and foremost, to for survival. I mean, really for survival. I, I don't, I mean, obviously I like the fact that we mentioned imagination and mind is a constituent of primacy of existence or existence existence just existing but you know it's it's an aspect of it but it doesn't have a primacy over it it's not some type of god in some other realm that you know some mind outside of it it's it's embedded within the material structure of reality and it's important to understand that it's not either or and i think this is what your uh derek your uh, your blog that you did that kind of spurred this whole idea of first principles uh, just to kind of go back to that idea of you know the mythologized version of Pythagoras traveling all through India, and all he discovered is that someone's selling an idea. Someone's either selling the idea of a god or gods or this mystical version of reality, and other people are selling an atheism, a materialism that there is no mind. It's it's just an, uh, it's just a sort of categorization that we impose meaning on our reality, but we don't actually discover it. And uh, I think that's a, what he actually found out is both are inherent within the structure of reality itself, and to deny one for the other seems to be the great problem for the past two or three thousand years and we need to recognize the limitations that both exist but they both are somewhat limited and how do we use this sort of these ideas to you know communicate really common needs first and foremost I didn't think about that actually until you know Lisa had that wonderful conversation with Lana uh, Red Ice Creations and just mentioned common needs and I was like oh yeah that makes it so much more commonsensical because there are common needs that we need you know to use to communicate how to survive, you know, getting food, getting shelter, these sorts of things. I think that's first and foremost probably why we started using language to communicate, you know, maybe how to build a tool, how to make fire, whatever it be, you know, just other utterances we could, could that would have some familiarity to what we're trying to explain in tangible reality. So. Well, would it be possible to use words to meet our needs or even have needs at all if existence didn't exist and our consciousness was secondary to it? Consciousness being a way to interact with reality. Ah, I stumped you guys on the third question. No, go ahead, I can't Melissa. even imagine. Go ahead. <laughs> I can't even imagine a scenario when that would be realistic. <laughs> I think it implies so I, sort of cause and effect, right? In a way. Uh, All right, yeah. so we're stumbling onto the origins of philosophy. We understand that words are indicative of existence. Something exists, and we can talk about it. We can say it is or it is not. And these are some of the basic fundamentals that we all should have learned in public school or college or in the workplace, but they, you know, they don't see fit to teach us these things. So you're left to you know, do self-study, such as we're doing here, find these things out for ourselves through a line of inquiry. So the next question would be, if existence exists, what are some of the things that make us believe it's true? I mean, obviously, if you can understand the words that I'm saying, there are several underlying concepts or axioms that go on before we can even have communication. In order for you to disagree with what I'm saying, existence would have to exist, you would have to be conscious of it, you would have to understand the logical words and respond in kind. So isn't it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's like we're fish in water and you don't understand the water until you actually break it down and say, hey, look, we've got a name for this thing. And, you know, we are experiencing it all the time. We're using these concepts implicitly in the struggle to make it explicit. They came up with this thing called philosophy. And I think that's one of the most interesting things that's not being talked about out there is the practical application of how to use philosophy to be an autonomous individual that's outgrowing the extended adolescence. Well, until... Uh... Kevin and his wonderful research kind of brought about the idea of a liberal arts. I mean, the, the liberal arts that was defined in, you know, insofar as the book I use, Socratic Logic, is just the liberating arts. They're meant for yourself, not for the use of someone else. So whether or not that has any real true bearing anymore, <laughs> that definition for me, if you hold it to that, makes sense insofar as philosophy is really designed for, for yourself, you know, for your own uh, way to come to a certainty or at least some aspect of certainty in your reality, some aspect of truth. 
Uh, and obviously, these, these words I'm using presuppose certain ideas about reality that exist beyond my con concept of them, beyond what you know, I, I impose my meaning of them. So it's important to understand there's a foundation, I guess, from which all of this comes from. And I, I think that's the, that's the important thing. I think that's what we're getting at. And that's what Aristotelian logic or just logic or the trivium, not the classical trivium, that it just gets back to these these uh, foundational concerns that, uh, have, like what Melissa said, present a sort of limitation. Uh, and that limitation allows us to at least acknowledge it and work with it. Uh, otherwise, if it was unlimited, I don't think there'd be anything to define and work with. So, you know, well, not to get it, too abstract. <laughs> I think if it were unlimited, that human minds would be infallible and you wouldn't need to discern reality using reason. And I think the fact that the human mind is fallible is why we need to use reason. Uh, at least that's what I found. Have you guys found another, a better reason for reason? I don't have an answer to that specific question, but I come hopping back to what you were speaking of before, uh, wondering why they don't teach this in school. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually trying to think of when would be the appropriate time? What, what, how would these ideas be presented and at what age? Could they be presented? The only thing I'm coming up with is uh, when you teach kids the very basics of their their nouns and their their verbs and their prepositions. You know, these these are things in your world. These are relationships in your world, and this is your reality. Uh, but these headier subjects, I uh, when would those be best presented? Maybe that's why they don't really teach them in school. Well, I was just going to say, I think that the appropriate time to teach them in school about these things would be before the teachers start using declarative sentences to teach the children without the children asking questions and finding their own answers. So when you get down to it, it would be, you know, you would have to teach a child at a young age that not all declarative sentences are true. I think most adults don't realize that yet. I think, you know, if not, why not? If all declarative sentences are not true, why aren't they true? Well, some people just don't have a way to get the truth, and other people lie. Wow, there's a reason to use reason. We need to be discerning listeners when we hear people talking. And I think that brings in some elementary ideas that we expose children to this entire massive learning system without preparing them how to defend themselves intellectually. Why might that be done as a, not a one-time thing in one school, but a comprehensive strategy, as John Taylor Gatto has pointed out in his work? It's been philosophically justified. I mean, I, I, unfortunately, when they developed this sort of form of state schooling in Germany, I mean, and actually before, but, you know, we'll go back to Germany here. By then, the philosophical roots of what happened during the Enlightenment had denied any sort of foundational aspect of coming to know reality itself. This is the Enlightenment. <laughs> this is essentially the skeptical attitude that destroyed foundational thinking, destroyed the idea that existence exists. You know, how can we truly know that? Or is it just our ideas? You know, is it just, uh, is our reality kind of mold the experience and shape it in a certain way? I mean, that's essentially what they thought. And then so far what happened was they made it into a sort of science, a sort of just, uh, they took the meaning out of words and how it relates back to these categories that exist in reality, you know, there's very simple ideas that, you know, nouns relate to substances or just the actual things, you know, how the, how these simple words we use actually relate to tangible physical reality. They took that away. They took the meaning out of that and uh, not to get too crazy into two different ter really abstract terminology. I mean, that's been philosophically justified in the highest ranks of philosophy during the enlightenment. And then we got this form of state schooling that kind of, it's a, it's a philosophy or, you know, it's an ethics of utilitarianism, the greatest good for the greatest number. That's the argument. And it, since it takes the meaning or the, you know, the idea of soul or essence out of uh, individual, it's really about how you manage a greater collective. And that's, I think, what's been developed. It's not so much about making sure our abstractions meet up with tangible reality. It's about how you mold tangible reality to get what you want out of it. And so that's where this idea of authoritative, you know, uh, or these authorities come in and kind of guide our experience, prescribe our rights, say what reality should or should not be. Uh, now, whether, I mean, it, the philosophers who had this sort of skeptical idea, you know, they're not necessarily bad people, but the people that would want to control other people, impose their will uh, over the needs of other people, I think that's where they'll take any philosophy 
whether it's uh, you know it's something based on God or something based on atheism, it doesn't matter. It's just still take any philosophy to justify why they have the right to control or use it to you know manipulate a way a child thinks or the way we think as individuals or the way we come to engage our reality. So there are people out there selling unrealities, and it's your job to be a, you know someone who practices intellectual self defense that questions declarative sentences and does not buy these unrealities as truth. So let's apply a little skepticism to these philosophical roots and ask the question, what is truth? It's verifiable. In existence? It has to be verifiable in existence? That's interesting. Is that what you mean? It has to be verifiable if they're saying it's uh something tangible or there will be some sort of effect that comes from an action you take um, or an action somebody else takes that you're asked to support. If it's not something tangible or having to do with actions, it, it's not really verifiable. It's an idea and it still exists. Maybe people agree on it and people disagree on it. But that doesn't mean it doesn't exist in somebody's mind. Derek, let me ask you, does truth apply equally to all? Yes, that's what I was about to say. It's consistent. Um, truth applies, like natural law, to everyone equally at all times. Is it this, oh, Go ahead. Go ahead, Tony. I was going to say this comes from a function of, yeah, right, what's, what's, what, what, the ability that we all have as individuals, you know, we all have five senses. This is so commonsensical. We all have the ability to abstract or essentially create a concept. Even though the concept's held only in the mind that doesn't exist in reality, we can all do this. And then we use words to communicate these concepts. And that, that's, it's all about matching up these different aspects. So when Melissa says it's about um, verifiable, essentially it's about the evidence from which we perceive how to imagine intangible reality and seeing if those concepts in our mind can match up. But we all have this ability to do it. I think that that's the amazing thing is we all have the ability to do it. Whether or not we engage it or use it, we do have the ability. And that's the, that's the sort of foundational thinking Aristotle is going on, that we all have this ability. It's so, it's so inherent to the structure of everything that it's not something that needs to really be commented on. I guess this is also made, you know, comment on the Declaration of Independence. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, you know, even okay, though so that's not... It's, it's, a, it's a common sense. We have common sense because we have common senses. Human beings have sensory perception abilities or capabilities that are in common, mostly with everybody, unless you have some severe disability where you're cut off and you have to rely more heavily on your other senses. This is how our mind comes in contact with matter. And in between mind and matter, we have to use words to connect these things. And this is an indicator of mental health. Is your mind in synchronization with re reality? If you bump into someone who's irrational, they might be dangerous. And these are things we recognize in society. People who do not use logic or, or, or deny that they use logic even, they can be irrational. They can be dangerous. These are people we want to protect ourselves from physically and intellectually. So is it possible using this common sense that we're now discovering for ourselves and naming specifically, is it possible to write a sentence or to declare a sentence to make an argument that is true for some people and not for others? No. Why not? The law of identity. Everything is something. It has a nature. It is what it is. Melissa, it, what do you think? Well, go ahead, Tony. No, no, go, go ahead. I was just going to say that's, that's a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not because uh, if it is true for one person, the perception and the sensing of that, whatever is predicated of that subject, whatever you're saying there, it has to be true for all. I mean, we're not saying that an attribute, that you're giving an attribute to something like the dog is brown. That's not true of all dogs, but it is true for every person that might run into that dog. They would all perceive the color brown for that dog. The truth doesn't change just because it can only be said of one thing, the truth is something that's observed and sensed by every, every other being around it. 
and we form a universal concept of it, just meaning that like a dog uh, has certain attributes that are characteristic of all dogs. You know, it's, it has certain characteristics uh, and they represent real aspects of it. And this is, this is the idea, this is the foundational understanding of how we engage our world and how we communicate with others. This fosters a natural law or natural law ethics eventually, essentially. And, you know, this is something that actually has been common on ironically for like 2000 years until the, you know, really in the enlightenment that took away the sort of natural law concept. But whether or not people adhere to it, that's another story. But the idea that we have this ability to kind of get on this com common ground is, is really powerful. And I think it's so, it's so overlooked, even amongst our highest ideas of philosophy today, that it's, it's amazing that, you know. But then again, we see this sort of ethics and the sort of culture we now inherit. And we kind of see these problems of communication and the inability to really comment on anything. And it's, it's, it, becomes a, it becomes an interesting, an interesting, you know, idea to express. So. Well, I've long been observing a linguistic gap that's been growing between, uh, you know, the 99% and the 1%. The 1% is definitely using language to their advantage. And by the rest of us not learning how to do likewise uh, and practice intellectual self-defense to protect ourselves from the unrealities, we're helping them do exactly what they want to do because we're not resisting, you know, between our ears. So I want to comment also on the the fascinating nature that there can be declarative sentences like we can use language to make up all these unrealities but we cannot construct a sentence that is true for some people and not for others and I'm arguing that the law of identity is built into language for a reason and you can prove that I'll have an answer for you in a few days <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know what I need to check out. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, you're it's, saying these things relate to categories of real things we experience, like the nouns relate to the substances we experience, the adjectives relate to uh, aspects or qualities of it. It's the idea that our language literally matches up to aspects of reality itself. And, uh, because, um, I'm losing what you, your main <laughs> thing was, but the idea is you, you can't impose your will because we have these common needs and we use language and language in a common aspect. You can't impose your idea of truth or your will over that person because we all share that same common essence, that same reality, the same fact that we inherit a body that I can't just become someone else at any one time. That law of identity uh, is literally built into the, the structure of how we then go about explaining the uh, reality itself. And they, there is something, and not to get too abstract, for ideas in our mind, and they have a certain reality too, but they have a limitation to that reality, and it's important to understand uh, that both exist and both have limitations, but I think what you're getting at is just the idea that there, um, the primacy of existence, that nature exists, and there's no contradictions in nature uh, because of the law of identity, because things are themselves uh, they can't be otherwise. If they could, it would be in perpetual contradiction. Now, I'm not sure nature could sustain its own existence, but then you get into kind of philosophical ideas. And <laughs> so thus far, we've uh, discovered that existence exists, truth exists, and truth is connected into language through logic. So what are the other values that truth can have to an individual? In other words, why is it so important for an individual to be able to find truth and what are the consequences if we do not? Well, to acquire satisfaction in life, uh, self-confidence, um, personal value, you know, happiness. To make sure we use our resources in ways that benefit us and are not, uh, we're not being duped and using our resources to benefit other people exclusively to our own detriment like consumerism likes us want, would like us to do. Obsolescent Ob manufacturing, the idea that there's someone guiding the way that our small communities just try to sustain themselves and try to, you know, uh, build, you know, bolster themselves. I, I think that's just, it's so, and that's something that's so commonsensical, this the idea of having, and having relationships with other people and the way we engage with the resources and build our rea realities together. Uh, there's something to be said about that immediate cause and effect and what happens when you remove that and how we kind of lose ourselves to f fantastical ideas and whatnot. So it is amazing what, what can happen when you build a very pyramidal structure. <laughs>
Well, it's a good point. If you're talking about building our respective individual realities without infringing upon the volition and free will of others, we, you know, again, we should have been taught about these sort of things before we got too far in life, before we went and made all these different decisions and acted certain ways because we didn't know any better. And so I think the, 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 the deprivation of these sorts of ideas in our culture are leading to many of these root causes and root, you know, the, of these problems. So I think it really starts once we learn how to get back to the basics and communicate in such a way that everyone can understand as individuals and that's what puts us on the same page together. So taking a step in that direction, how could we accurately define this thing that we're talking about that is common to all of us as reality or objective existence or any of these sort of terms? Do any of you have a good definition which might accurately describe the scenario which we find ourselves in? I just refer to it as what is existence. The exit primacy of existence, that things actually exist in themselves uh, and that we can know them or we can discover that we can discover them and discover the order inherent with them and not impose our will onto them, impose what we think they should be, you know, that's or impose how we think the way they should act. Um, I think that's such a, it's always ironic, you know, going back to this idea of truth or this idea even of maybe let's say freedom it comes back to this idea that existence exists, that we inherit a world of limitation, that things are themselves uh, inherently, and that we have to learn that we compare and contrast these different things and try to work with uh, and make a judgment as to what, what it is and what it means for us, but it still exists. Um, it doesn't negate that sort of existence. We still wake up every day and go through the same routine every day and try to get through our respective realities every day with the same understanding. It's, 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 it's so commonsensical, yet these ideas have been logically justified the other way for usually other means. So <laughs> justify other means. And I, you know, so if you wanted a reality or a definition of reality, is that what you wanted? Yeah, definition, definition of reality. Of reality. Yeah, the classical definition, I guess, of every substance, action, attribute, and relationship that this was or ever will be. But I think in more, not to get too intense as to what those categories mean, you know, existence is just all the real things that actually exist in it. And then we match up our words to how we relate to those real things in it. Uh, our words relate to concepts. They're only held in our minds. But we just try to, we're all, it's, a con it's a continuous process of trying to match up the unrealities of our mind to the realities that exist in the world. And in some case, we really can use language to know certain things uh, for certain. Uh, you know, some people, for example, some people might say, well, we can't be certain the sun will rise tomorrow. Well, we can be certain that the sun will either rise or not rise tomorrow. You know, we, it's, it's, that, it's that commonsensical. Most people have that certain idea. But, you know, we can always skeptically argue one way or the other or develop a universal idea that, beyond that so it, it's it's more or less just always going back to the foundations that in existence exists i think i uh, think that it's uh anthropocentric to think that the sun rises at all and that oh, we yeah. haven't updated our terms in like centuries but you know, <laughs> we all talk like that and we understand what we're saying and we communicate and we can show up at places on time and the whole world is out there working logically except a couple key places and i think it's those places where it's like when you, when you ask the question, because a lot of people don't ask the question, what is existence? How would you define it? But what you come to find out is that it's all these words and that everything in here we name uh, becomes part of a non-blurry background. It's out, it stands out in focus. And when you're a baby, you come into the world and everything's a blur. And then you learn a, a word like mom. And then everything's just mom. There's nothing else. Everything else is a blur. And then there's mom. <clears throat> and then you, you, know, you learn some other words and you can go on and continue building out. But it's about every substance, action, relationship, entity, these also turn into nouns, verbs, prepositions, and so forth. So when we make those connections between the language we use and the existence in which we inhabit, in which we're trying to identify these problems and have solutions, it helps to have a common starting point and have that starting point be something we can all relate to, which is objective existence, which has objective truth because of the law of identity. We'll go into that in a minute, why that is. But let's just say that there are some things that are predictable and we should be using these methods of logic to get as much out of the predictability because there is so much unknown. There is so much fear and all these other things that we have to deal with at some point. But you have to start with getting real and synchronizing your mind with that which exists. And that has to do with using the proper words 
and nomenclature to understand the problems, to identify the contradictions, and to move forward. So to summarize, existence is identity. Everything here has a name and it stays itself. This cup will not turn into a lizard no matter how hard any of us think of it. It'll be a cup, the whole presentation. And consciousness is our mental process of identifying that which exists and <clears throat> putting names on it. So let's talk about this word consciousness. What is consciousness? And are any of you conscious right now? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> what were you before before I asked that question? That's always the question, right? When we're not conscious, what are we? I think consciousness is the ability to be reflexive, to 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 reference our own internal existence and thoughts and to be aware of the fact that we are thinking and discussing and having an internal dialogue being just self-aware, I suppose. And I suppose if you're not conscious, you're oblivious, ignorant. The oblivion. A zombie. <laughs> A zombie. I mean, it, I think actually, Rich, you already, you already answered your own question before you asked the question, which by saying, asking a question itself, you know, in uh, Socratic logic, the first, literally the first section of the book is called understanding and then within the first paragraph he says what we have compared to everyone else and everything else is the ability to ask a question that internal dialogue that melissa just mentioned is what creates a concept is what creates abstractions and these universal ideas that we endlessly comment on but that's that's that starting point asking a question you know what is it why is it whether it is these sorts of things these develop these sorts of concepts in our heads and then it's about matching up these questions to the reality that we experience. All right, and so I, consciousness, that which makes us human, appears to have something to do with thinking, and thinking uh, is always uh, initiated by the question mark, not the period. I find that interesting, that we have something in our language that actually initiates the process of thinking, but we don't use question marks too much, especially in the newspaper, the media. They use declarative sentences, unsubstantiated. They're like, no, here's the truth, we're selling this, and if you believe it, you're buying. So. I think it's important that we bring the question mark back in the style because I think, as Tony just observed, that's what kicks off thinking, that's what kicks off consciousness, that what's, that's what makes us human. And when we see a bunch of irrational, inhuman things going on around the world, I would argue one of the problems is unconscious people taking actions. That's dangerous. That's not cool. We don't want that to happen. So let's dig a little bit deeper. What is this process that we call thinking? Can anyone use words to describe the process of thinking. So identifying. I mean, thinking requires essentially, like I would say, uh, three different aspects to it. One's asking a question, and when we ask a question, we form a concept, and those concepts, so then we relate two concepts to each other in a proposition and see whether it's true or not. And we try to test it in, in, you know, arguments and in language. And this is this is all uh, builds upon itself in the process of reasoning itself. And this is, uh, you know, I guess to get to the etym etymology of reason, you know, to reify or these things that we compare and contrast in our reality and form words to see how we match up to it. This all it, thinking implies all of this. So it's not just the asking the question, it's forming the concept and then it's testing out those concepts and propositions and, you know, logic and syllogisms and all these ways we test them out through language. That's, I mean, I think that probably implicates all of it. Could be wrong, but I would imagine it has all those things. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying there, Tony. Um, it seems like there's a, a definite connect between identifying the reality of whatever is existing using a term which is also leading into making a judgment which takes the form of a sentence or a quote, usually a sentence and then you're finally moved down until you have a full syllogism of things with terms and propositions and, and that's how you test that reality to see if you're dealing with some truth or if you're being misguided. And it starts out with what Derek said, you know, it starts out with just the identity itself. 
And it starts out with just because that's that's really important because it's starting out with our perceptions first that we actually perceive this world before we abstract these concepts, you know, extricate, split apart green from grass to form, you know, just the universal idea of, you know, a grass or just universal idea of a man, you know, taking each specific instance of the men or women that we perceive in our reality and form this I, this universal idea of man and these, you know, these qualities and these aspects that make up you know, what all men and women share and have in common, the yeah, power of reason and the ability to sense our world. And, you know, to be able to abstract that and be able to put that into a certain formal understanding helps us to be able to then attach a word to it that we can communicate so we can get on the same grounding equal level. You know, it's really about getting on the same page with each other so we can find ways to meet, again, common needs. First and foremost is probably why this is really developed, why we use language. And then obviously once we do, we can philosophize about all the more interesting abstractions that can come from it. But I think first and foremost, it really must go with just probably the idea of first identifying as, and then, you know, testing out those identifications with the concepts in our heads. Just so it, it, it has all those different things implied. So if the purpose of thinking is to identify knowledge so that we can meet our needs, how would we identify or define knowledge? I would say knowledge is a set of facts that, or a single fact that has come through that, that process that Tony was going through, where you apprehend, you give it a term, you identify, you eliminate the contradictions, and, and you come to a point where you trust it, you can verify it, you can, you can see it over and over again. Other people can see it, and uh, that's the truth of it, and it becomes useful as a building block for building up more with other statements that you know are true, other facts that you know are true, to build more inferences and to move forward to uh, more general truths. I heard the words non-contradictory and identification, and I would have to assume of things that exist and not of things that don't exist, because things that don't exist, like gremlins or something like that, we can't attain knowledge because they're not things that exist that have actual measurements and they're not tangible, so I'm gonna have to dismiss that and say, you must be assuming uh, these things exist. So non-contradictory identification of that which exists, that leads to knowledge. The process of doing that might be pretty interesting because we're all looking for knowledge and this is gonna be how to get to knowledge. So would anyone disagree with the, uh, the definition that knowledge is non-contradictory identification of something that exists. But Rich, what is a contradiction? Ah, that's a good question. I'm going to throw it back at you, man. Do you want me to answer? <laughs> I'm just, you know, it, what I, well, a yeah, contradiction, sure, go well, a contradiction will be a, an attempted break in the rule of identity, the law of identity, where my cup would be a lizard at the same time and in the same respect that it is a cup and it can't do that. So when you identify things like that, it's really easy to sort it out. So, uh, you know, someone cannot be a terrorist and not a terrorist in the same time and respect as the government might claim, for instance. It's a good definition, but that's very true. And that's, that's a good point, because that does lead to then what Melissa said, when Derek implicated the idea of knowledge uh, relates then to reality, identity, uh, non, -contra non yeah, contradictory identification. So, yeah, I, I guess I didn't, um, disregard everything I'm just saying there because I'm totally losing my train of thought. All right. So, <laughs> so if I'm if I'm keeping the train of thought, we have mind and we have matter. We have things that exist, and then we have knowledge that we can have about things that exist. And it seems that we need a process to integrate this mind and matter. And upon some study on my part, I discovered that was called logic. And I would describe logic as a process by which a human being synchronizes their mind with reality and reality with their mind. You do that through something called inductive and deductive. We can talk about that in a little bit. But let's just talk about this idea of logic, of synchronizing this coincidentia appositorum, the mind and the matter that we all have to deal with, uh, the combined essence of which is what we call life. I, 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 there's a comment I do want to make. I don't know if it even pertains to the question you just asked, but I guess it goes back to the idea of knowledge as presupposes, again, the, you know, the law of identity, but that there's a foundation to what we're trying to describe through language. 
Uh, so often I hear people be one way, either I say there's something beyond or say that it's all skeptical conclusions that we can't ever truly be sure of how reality matches up because it's just ideas in our mind that our senses are imperfect or that our mind's imperfect. But we at least can find ways to test this out and come to some sort of certainty that we can find some sort of knowledge and truth based on the fact that existence does exist. The fact that there is non-contradictory identification, that things cannot uh, be in two places, be in the same place at the same time, the same respect. You know, the cup can't be both the cup and the lizard at the same time. If this it weren't does, for the law of identity, you couldn't have car accidents because what that is is two cars trying to occupy the same space at the same time. So uh, nature doesn't allow contradictions. It says it can't happen. That's why physically two people cannot observe the same thing from the same perspective at the same time. So that again goes back to the uniqueness and that again goes back to everything that we have in common with everyone else and how unique we are. And our perception of what's true changes and becomes updated and optimized as we go through time and gather more facts that we didn't have access to prior to that. It's always changing. Our, our perception of what truth is is always changing. It doesn't mean that it was that it's a new truth. It just means that you've updated your belief and now you have a much better understanding and grasp, a more whole grasp of what is true. And you can kind of throw away that other version that no longer serves it. Well, I think we got into a point where we can, you know, after talking about truth and finding its value and, and trying to seek this out on a methodical, you know, constant basis. I think that maybe we should discuss, you know, what would be uh, the process of actually studying truth and that which exists. I mean, surely at some point in history, people came up with a name for that which we're trying to do right now. Big bad P word, right? Philosophy? <laughs> I think it's a bad word because we don't hear about it in school. We're not encouraged to like learn these ideas. And so, yeah, I guess it is a big bad P word, philosophy. Can anyone define <laughs> what it actually uh, means? What does it mean, Tony? Well, the definition, I mean, uh, the only way I can define it is in a nominal definition, just defining the name itself. It comes, I believe, from two Latin concepts, uh, philo and sophia. Uh, so for philo means the love of, sophia means wisdom. So for the love of wisdom uh, is essentially what philosophy in essence is about. It's, uh, it's studying uh, and coming to know the aspects of our mind and reality uh, for the love of doing so for itself, not for someone else or something else. Well, sure, you don't need a good reason to survive. This is the process of figuring out what is true, what is knowledge so you can survive. If you were surviving in the woods, you would want to know, is this a plant I can eat or will I get sick and die from eating this? You would also want to be certain and you would want to have some experience. So these are things that human beings have used probably even before they had words and could possibly be the, the, the genesis of words was the need to communicate with each other consistently to survive against maybe enemies that had technological advances that weren't of a linguistic variety. So this idea of philosophy is really developing a habit of asking questions of declarative sentences because declarative sentences our conclusions, our judgments, our decisions, and you have the right to know how the step-by-step -step conclusion was derived. Otherwise, it's just a case of, because I say so, and then that person becomes an authority and you have to become subservient. It's like a master-slave dichotomy. It's not cool. So it's even better, you know, these days to have philosophy at your side because then you don't have to be subservient and outsource your thinking to someone else. You would actually be able, through having a philosophy, to recognize that Something exists, we are conscious of that something, and it is necessary for, for identification to happen. Identity occurs in this cup on its own, but until you know what to refer to it as in the language of the region you're in, you're left at a, 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 like a, a crevasse that you can't communicate across. So these ideas of philosophy have been studied for thousands of years. I'm sure somebody at some point has written down some laws, some basic tenets, some basic uh, components of philosophy, and I'd like to get into those. Does, does anyone off the top of their head know any of the uh, primary components of philosophy as it was developed? I think we've brought it up a few times already. The law of identity is the big king of the law of thought here. I mean, yeah, metaphysical realism, if we have to get in these really complex terms, something that's been assumed for like some centuries and centuries that reality really exists and that we can know reality 
how do we know it? Through our five senses. And I, th I think those two things are what is inherent in all philosophy. Uh, obviously, you know, there are different ways in which we come then to use what we know about the existence and that's ethics and morality and those sorts of things and how we develop social systems. But, you know, it again, it goes back to the idea that there is a real physical world and that we can at least know it with some sort of certainty, uh, how we develop and what we do about it. You know, that's another story, but that's, that's essentially, so philosophy has, is ingrained into the structure of how we live our lives and how we then go about constructing our societies and our, uh, our voluntary interactions with other people. So in that way, it's actually literally a survival mechanism. Uh, if language is embedded into the structure of what makes us different from all the rest of the animals, uh, then the, it is essentially the ultimate form of a survival structure, philosophy itself. For the love of wisdom, though, I mean, that, that gets into a little bit different idea, but still, it's a sort of technology if I dare say. I think understanding the law of identity and recognizing its place in, in history that has not been talked about yet, uh, that's technology. Being able to use that type of uh, understanding in such a way that it hasn't been practiced in a long time because the knowledge that was once prevalent among, say, our founding fathers of how to use language in their own defense and to defend themselves intellectually from sophisticated ideas uh, is gradually lost through the corruption of the American school system. And what we get back to is a world in the 20th and 21st centuries where the irrationality is really predicated on everyone philosophizing from midstream and not having a connection in their philosophy, their so-called philosophy, that actually goes back to existence. And if you can be conscious of existence, you can see the law of identity everywhere and then you can see subservient laws, little cor corollaries like cause and effect and all these other things that we really can't escape in this game called life. So what are some of the risks of philosophizing from midstream and what are some of the problems that are being caused in the world as a result of not having a so-called philosophy connected to reality? People are coming to erroneous conclusions. By erroneous conclusions, do you mean that they uh, accept the changing of definitions of uh, security to the actions of tyranny and they think that's okay? Or do you have any specifics? Well, just that people are letting their um, perceptions be, uh, you know, manipulated. So they come to conclusions not on their own, but from, you know, what somebody else has painted for them. And Derek, what is the benefit to someone who casts an unreality upon an unwitting audience? How, how do they benefit? Why would they actually do that? And what do they have to gain? Plunder. They could plunder people's production. Was that something that was recognized years ago in the founding of this country? I would say so. And after uh, they recognized this, did they do something or anything about it? Did they memorialize this using words at some point to describe their situation? There were quite a few words written uh, to memorialize it, but uh, they did other things other than just talk. <laughs> that requires existence in order to showcase what they wanted to memorialize in their words in the Constitution. You know, it's I mean, obviously it had to be backed up by a certain action as well. Uh, and that's just an example. Obviously, unfortunately, the Constitution has been usurped by other words now. <laughs> but it's, that's the power of uh, language and forgetting that existence exists. Uh, and and the, the changing of the definition of the words. Yes. Well said. Well said. I forgot about that. Yeah, and everyone becomes confused from there because everyone has their standard definition. But over time, the definition doesn't just change overnight, but it changes gradually with new generations because the new generations have a different meaning to you know what freedom or what an individual right might mean to them based on their own different experiences from what maybe their grandparents or the great-grandparents went through to preserve those rights. How did words play a role in the founding of America? Well, look at the, the, the Bill of Rights. Um, you know, what are those things that they're listing there? Um, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. Um, are they afraid that somebody might get down on their knees in the in the privacy of their own home and 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 um, and pray? Are they afraid that somebody's you know lips will move uh, and they'll make noises and form words to other people? Or are they afraid of uh, 
you know, ink on paper. They're not afraid of those things. They're afraid of ideas and ideas spreading that they, you know, that they can't control. Um, so they I mean, need to control the idea. That's the only so, war that's gone on through history is the war yeah. to suppress consciousness waged against those who seek to express consciousness. And I think mm -hmm. the American Revolution was an explicit note of that in the Declaration of Independence. And they said, hey, existence exists. King George exists. He sucks. We've got some words here that logically separate us from him. And King George, you know, uh, Boston Massacre, that's, the, that's violence. You know, uh, Lexington and Concord, that's violence. That's an if that's an admission on the part of the crown that they are intellectually bankrupt, that they don't have any logical reason that you are their servant, why you should serve them or pay their taxes. And, be, you know, they're saying, because I said so, when they're using violence. And so that's an admission of intellectual bankruptcy. And the American colonists knew it, which is why they fought back, where if you contrast that to today, you could have that same intellectual bankruptcy being espoused and people have somehow learned or unlearned things in order to learn uh, to love their servitude yep and the founding generation took responsibility real seriously yeah, they didn't look to somebody else yeah. for there is a uh, strong independent ethics oh my goodness that's something i see like that's even with my my great aunt and uncle and my you know my great grandparents uh, when they were alive, like they just had to, I mean, then I imagine that their, you know, parents and grandparents had even stronger ethics to that, like just that self-responsibility, uh, their ability to do it themselves or re only rely on people within their community, people they had tangibly interacted with. Uh, it just, it really is interesting the different sort of culture we get, how, how over generations we've, they bred the liberty out of us and redefined the words and, yeah, you know, they've hey, tried. They've tried, but it's been unsuccessful at this point. And as soon as we put it all back together and create agree. media so people can communicate with each other, I think uh, their 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 ride is going to end real quick. Yeah. Well, they've even tried to change uh, what you know what modern Americans think. Why why you know why we separated from England to begin with? You know, oh, it was taxation when taxes were were pretty low. Um, there was a. Um, newspaper uh, a guy that was uh i can't remember his name he was a, a captain he fought in the battles of lexington concord and like in the early 1800s he was interviewed by some highfalutin um uh, you know journalist from new york city and he kept asking well you know did you fight did you fight because of the stamp act you know did you you know and finally he got it and said no we just meant to rule ourselves and they meant that we not Again, it's so brief and simple that you almost miss the, the gravamen of that truth. That's, that's, that's the only reason. I mean, at some point, the straw breaks the camel's back, but the taxation back at the revolution is minuscule compared to what people tolerate today, 40% yeah. and up. I mean, King George didn't have a system like that, and he was ruling over us directly. How are we supposedly free and have a worse system than when we weren't? Exactly, and they the colonists do very well the um, the importance of um, perception, and uh, I don't know you know they they chartered a private boat to get you know their side of the events to England before the official story got there, and um, that definitely had an effect. Um, and another thing is these uh, that day didn't occur in a vacuum. Uh, there were a lot of things that led up to that day. Um, John Adams says, you know, the American Revolution was won before a shot was ever fired. It was won in the hearts and the minds of the people. And that for 15 to 20 years before that day, there was a change in people's attitudes and perceptions and religious views and philosophical views. Um and uh, I think a lot of them were using that question mark. So what is the risk of using authority as our metric for truth and not using existence as our metric for truth? What kind of difficulties or problems could that cause in our world? Slavery. Mm, that sounds bad. What the other prescript kind Prescription of perceptions. So your perceptions aren't your own. They're predefined by the authority. 
Uh, so in that case, it's whether or not you're allowing the authority to have some idea of uh, guide the way you interact with your world first and foremost, and then the concepts you derive from it. It sounds like that the authority is trying to circumnavigate your sensory perception and say, you don't need to look at this. We've looked at this. Here it is. Now you can just go with our logic and, you know, take these actions. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, an in, in authority in the sense that, um, lot, let me, let me clarify a little bit because when Please it comes do. to clarify that, dude. Okay. When it comes to authority, I mean, there are two aspects here because logic really should be used to be able to uh, validate what an authority is saying or not saying in this respect. So sometimes some there are authorities, at least in so far as having a certain specialized knowledge area, uh, maybe a doctor or a biologist or whatever, a special scientist that just has a different grasp on that language, really. Um, and what we can do is use la la uh, logic to analyze all these different aspects of language, all what they're trying to say, their, per their perceptions their conceptions and see if they match up to the reality we're, we're trying to understand. And so there is that aspect of how logic can be used to analyze an authority. But in this case, I think you're asked is saying is that how these authorities or this authoritative structure we now see in place, how they're kind of prescribing uh, rights, prescribing the way we formalize or formulate our perceptions and conceptions. They're not our own necessarily, and we're not testing out their own. They're, they're essentially being prescribed on us by someone else or something else. And so therefore, uh, it doesn't actually necessarily always have to relate back to tangible existence. We're asking someone else to give us their definition of that tangible existence. And that sometimes doesn't always meet up with uh, those common needs and those common commonalities we talked about earlier. I hope that kind of answers it. So before we inquire further into what actually comprises philosophy and how to use it, let's recap it. Some humans lie, some humans can't tell truth from untruth, and some humans don't undertake that method of discerning truth on a consistent basis. That pretty much covers what you interact with during the day. You have people who intentionally lie to you, we need to recognize that. You have people who unintentionally pass along information that's not knowledge, we need to be able to recognize that and possibly help them on their way to find what they're looking for. And then we need to remember to do that process for ourselves consistently question all the things in our mind and make sure that we've checked into the things that we believe in and actually get past belief and get to the point where we have some useful knowledge which then can be shared which is a process called as a wisdom as they say the process of sharing knowledge with others so what are the components of philosophy's foundations we've kind of mentioned these words but i wanted to dig into the first one metaphysics which i understand to be tangible objective reality aka matter Tony, could you give me some more insight on what metaphysics is and why it's one of the first principles of philosophy? Well, I think uh, Derek and Melissa have already, they've stated it a couple of times in a couple of different ways, uh, very well said. It's really just what is. It's a law of identity, it's existence, it's reality, uh, it's, a, you know, uh, it's these sort of functions. Metaphysics, not to get too much into the story, but I believe it was, uh, it came after the book of physics that uh, Aristotle, metaphysics after physics, uh, wrote down. It really is about what exists. Ultimately, it was redefined in sort of the objectivist sense of like what, what exists. In this case, it's the, the most foundational point from which all philosophy starts. Um, every single philosopher from and throughout history has essentially started with what exists. Uh, and that, you know, essentially it usually comes into, that's why I mentioned earlier the idea of metaphysical realism, what most philosophers guided their thoughts on, the idea that there is an objective reality. Um, now, it, it, it kind of goes in these sorts of foundational layers, so this would be the most foundational layer, asking just a simple question, what we mentioned earlier, a question, what is, what exists? It's asking a question, just what exists, uh, and that's metaphysics. Okay, so metaphysics is noticing that something exists. Now let's say something exists, like my coffee cup, and I want to attach a word or do something with it. I have to have a concept, I have to have identification of this thing before I can manipulate it. You have to work with nature before you can master it. So this brings us to this concept of epistemology, which is our internalization of the concepts that we get from our percept of reality. So the reason that metaphysics has primacy is because it has to do with existence. Epistemology is how you think about reality, and then we're gonna go one step further and talk about identity, which is the process of thinking. 
you are gaining through your epistemology and your percepts and your concepts knowledge about reality and you do that through identifying and labeling and using language and these three concepts come together to kind of make a, a triad that forms the foundation of all objective reality philosophy. Seemingly opposite things, they seem paradoxic, that which exists, and then your mental construct of that, the epistemological view of that which exists, and the process of coming to understand your reality and draw knowledge from that is through observing what, you, what exists and then processing that and removing any contradictions or conflicts of identity, apparent conflicts. Uh, paradox means pointedly foolish. So when you see a paradox, it doesn't mean something's actually in contradiction. It usually means you need to look further into the definition of the words that you're using or the objects that you're, you're clinging these labels to. So with that in mind, why are these terms, metaphysics, epistemology, the law of identity, why are they so alien and foreign to us when it's something that each of us needs to understand to actually use philosophy in a practical way to survive and thrive in the world? Well, I will say, I'd like to go back to, even before I answer that question, just to go back, that what, everything you're starting with, all these different foundational assumptions, assumptions or axioms, these uh, assumptions that are so, sort of self-evident, they're all questions, right? I think the really important thing here is that they're all they're all questions. Metaphysics is what exists. Epistemology is you know a big word. Just how do we know what exists? Uh, and you know the law of identity again is uh, asking a question: What is this thing? What is this thing? What is this thing? Identifying these different perceptions we have in our world. I just think it's really interesting that they all relate to an aspect of our mind, the ability for I think Melissa mentioned just self reflexivity. Just this the internal dialogue. Um, well, it provides a like a pivot point, like you guys are describing, and it's and it's in you know until you have that pivot point, that fulcrum, that lever in your mind through which you can interact between metaphysical reality, you know, tangible reality, and the subjective mental reality, and to you know have harmony between the those two through your mind, because your mind's really the bridge between those two things, and if your mind doesn't have a process to continually synchronize these two things. I would think that we could be taken advantage of, that our ideas and our identities could be usurped, and that our bodies could be outsourced as human resources to other people if we, you know, if we don't mind our P's and Q's and question all these declarative sentences. I think that for someone to say that existence isn't prime would say, you know, you know, they would also be arguing if you go downstream or upstream, they'd be arguing that they don't use questions in their life because questions would have no meaning. They would also demonstrate through their actions a lot of other inconsistencies. For instance, they probably eat and breathe and drink water and these sort of things that you need to do to survive. Those all involve logical survival processes in identifying when you need to do these things, the logistics of how to source them, the finances of how to pay for them, and all the different things that have to go on that are logical, reasonable processes that depend on existence and answering questions and being able to find knowledge. So if we need this philosophy because we live in a situation where some people like to plunder our freedom and liberty and we're not given philosophy at an early age to be able to understand these things, then it would stand to reason we can infer from that that the education system is controlled by people who are unreasonable, who seek to plunder us and use us as human resources, which is why we want to take it upon ourselves to, you know, observe these ideas, ask them questions, and see if we can find a tangible objective reality that could be communicated and have meaning to other people. So in the midst of this process, we come across these really big words that we really don't understand until you look into them, you define them, you practice with them, and then you give it a rest. And then you go back and do that same thing again, and you find you have a little bit better understanding. And so it's only after visiting these things, uh, inspecting them, and then leaving it alone, and then coming back to it, that we can increase our capability and our grasp, our understanding of these concepts that are essential not only to personal liberty, but to world liberty, because if the minds of individuals are being enslaved and put into groups, then that's a dandy way to take over the world and control its resources and to control humanity. And uh, that, that just seems irrational to take so many people's uh, volition away when it could be preventable. So in trying to bring this to a crescendo where we can understand what this all means, would it be an accurate statement to observe that all that exists is mind and matter, i.e. epistemology and metaphysics, and logic is the non-contradictory process of integrating 
mind, and matter. I would agree with the statement. I think it's an accurate statement. Um, I guess my question is, where does, um, is energy enveloped in that? Or does, is matter essentially energy? Or, or, or are they, we using the same term for the same idea there? I actually have a very interesting answer to that, which pertains to energy, but it's in a presentation I'm not prepared to, to take public yet. But that's a very provocative and interesting question, so I'm going to table that, and uh, I think you'll like the answer to it. But the, uh, my answer to it would be that, yeah, it, it involves energy, because without the conscious, you know, consciousness of your mind and your heartbeat and your body to connect the two together, it's, it's I'm not my body, I have a body. But I only know that I have a body because of the consciousness of my mind, which is enabled by the brain. And so I, ha I think we have yet to discern and distinguish and develop definitions that could accurately describe how life works here. I don't think we have an accurate definition of electricity or what it means to life here. And I think whoever defines electricity in an accurate form will discover uh, the, the secret of life because it's what beats our hearts and it's what powers our brains that enables our minds to connect in and have interaction in this 3D existence. <laughs> I couldn't agree more there, actually, and not to get too off topic, but that's, I have a friend who does, you know, chaos theory, mathematics, and bunch of stuff, and he always says, you know, it is interesting, the sort of self-organization you see with energy. So, just saying. That represents, that's kind of embodied with our mind. That rests on a, the brain rests on, you know, a material aspect of chemical and electrical interactions, yet it creates these immaterial ideas, uh, these immaterial concepts that don't have extension, but have ways of relating to the reality we experience. That's, to me, a sort of an incredible idea or function, now, function of reality. Whether it's by chance or not, I'm not going to make comment on it right now. <laughs> That's for a different presentation, but very interesting. <laughs> well, I mean, do you think it's by chance that logic provides this connectivity between your mind and matter, and matter in your mind through inductive and deductive reasoning? That's because an ordering process. It's natural. It's a discoverer, discovery of ordering. It's a discovery of order, rather. Uh, it's, we're not imposing order on the reality. We're discovering a sort of order. And the mind itself is that self-reflection ability to comment upon those general categories of the general things of that which relate to all, all the different things and the specific difference of those things that make it different from all the other things we to tangibly experience in our reality. So in that way, it's an ordering function, but it's not an imperfect ordering function. We can know things with certainty. We just have to test it out sometimes. It just takes a little bit of work and a little bit of cause and effect. Well, when you say, say going from general to specific and specific to general, <laughs> it also helps to break it down. I just picture it like, you know, you draw a little stick figure and, and you're in the middle and up here you have general, this is your understanding. Down here you have specific and this is physical reality. Physical reality, these things can be measured. Up here in your understanding, you have a concept of table, but it has no measurements, and that's the difference between concepts and what exists, right? And then you have a process to go from mind to matter, and from matter to mind, and then you have this little convection current, and when you have things that are specific, you can take generalities and get understanding, and have experience, and you can take that experience and bring it back to reality, and, and so when you have this convection current and you understand your place within it, uh, you know, I don't know if it was Parmenides, but someone said, that man is the measure of all things. We have to look at it rel rel relatively, and we have a mind that is not here in existing reality. I can't put it on the table. It's not something I can weigh or measure, but it is essential to the experience of being a human being. So is interacting with you know, ex as existential reality. Now, the problem with the 20th century is all the philosophy has taken it from uh, your mind doesn't exist, only science exists, and you are a clockwork orange, and we can manipulate you, and it's all external, it's all superficial, that ties into the conspicuous consumption, the outsourcing of our self-esteem to material objects. And yeah. so I'm saying, if we right. want to get our self-esteem back as individuals within America or any other place on this planet, we have to start with the self. You have to understand yourself before you can get esteem, and you can't have esteem without knowledge and confidence confident capability to go and take action with some high degree of certainty. So I'm saying that the people who have corrupted our education system are not only mega rich and ruthless, they're also cunningly smart because they knew exactly what to disable in our education system to take away the individuality, to take away the self-reliance, to take away the self-confidence that we all need to be successful. 
And it's only through asking questions and finding answers, through studying philosophy and learning more about how our mind connects to reality and reality connects to our mind, through thinking that I think we can outgrow the status quo and grow in the light direction. Yeah, I mean, that, that I do have one comment that does need to be made there, at least insofar as uh, the thing they did remove uh, is the power of concept formation. That itself is a, a, to understand and generalize to a universal concept. They t- philosophically justified the, removing that. And essentially, you know, logic was studied amongst all really the aristocratic and their sons and daughters of the, you know, the rich and powerful elite throughout time. Um, but these sorts of ideas of metaphysical realism, epistemological realism were known for a very, very long time. It wasn't until the 20th century when Percipia Mathematica was, uh, are you talking authored. about Bert Russell? Yes, I am. Nice. And that's where you get the sort of scientism. I oftentimes find I'm going up against when I, when people try to defi- a, to defend solipsism or defend skepticism, or different forms of skepticism, or even the, the other realm, defend the, that universals exist outside space and time. These general concepts exist outside of us. Uh, I have to say, no, 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 because uh, ultimately this was intellectually justified. And it, we, what they did was, and this is why the 20th century looks like a great uh, and unfortunate uh, experimentation on the whole populace of the world, because essentially it, it removed our ability to create a universal concept, to move our ability to ab- create, to have abstractions, to u- utilize the power of consciousness. And when you remove that ability, you become nothing but an if-then state statement, a computer statement. I know I deal in if-then statements all day. There is something to be said about it. The computer can only pump out uh, logical conclusions. It doesn't actually know the essence or meaning of the terms that it's pumping out. There are no terms in it. So in that case, there are no essential concepts to which it's relating. These general aspects it's trying to comment on versus what makes it different from other things, it does not know that. It's just endless if-then statements. Um, that fall ultimately. I'd also, note it, I'd also note that computers, you know, they don't have freedom yet. And even if they create artificial intelligence, they're not seeking to replicate human intelligence because human intelligence has the tendency for freedom. And so, what what is built into our minds as far as the tendency for freedom is the fact that our minds are fallible; that we can choose to think or not to think. We can choose to focus our minds and our consciousness or not. And that these are all things that nobody else can choose to do for us. They are things that you can only do for yourself. So again, it comes back to nature has these rules built into our existence. One of those other rules that we haven't talked much about is the law of contradiction. Does anyone want to take a, a whack at defining the law of contradiction or maybe providing a commonplace example to help people make it real? Nothing can be A and non-A at the same time and in the same respect. So that means you cannot owe taxes and not owe taxes or be guilty and not guilty at the same time and in the same respect. That's fascinating. Can anyone find a, a, an exception to that rule? Symbolic logic. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> kidding you. They that was the for... reason they created symbolic logic was to create a language to make a logical language that can't be broken, broken. Yeah, it, it, it removes the, our ability to find common ground and to find the differences from the things we perceive in our world. And that this way it becomes a, the qualities of mathematics. And mathematics itself is an art and it has certain artistic characteristics that exist unto itself but doesn't necessarily relate to our both our minds in the physical world and i think that's essentially what happens they ironically in the sort of skepticism that developed out of the 18th century in the 19th and 20th century they developed a this <laughs> idealized a sort of philosophy that denies metaphysics completely denies what is or what can be it denies our ability even really to know it and it allows for this endless sort of mathematical constructions about the nature of reality. Now, ironically, the people who really funded these sorts of philosophies had really the idea of how to manage large groups of people, the greatest good for the greatest number. It's really about management. It's really about coming up with philosophies that take away the essence of a human being and in place put in their own imposed will. And it's a justification for doing so. So that's why we find it in all manufacturing processes and all sorts of different scientific justifications. Not that there aren't times and places for these sorts of things. And certain, certainly these oh, philosophies they're, they're have their, their tools, right? right? 
Um, but to remove Aristotelian logic, to remove the, the sort of metaphysical understanding, to move the ability to use our language to relate these ideas uh, that we might discover in certain uh, very specialized form, formulations of science, that's, that's where the problem uh, resides. And that's really the compartmentalization that we see as individuals, I think, in our you know, highly stratified culture and society. And that creates a knowledge gap, you know, it creates a power, that knowledge gap ultimately creates a power gap, which is just a language gap or an ability to express those universal concepts from what they're actually finding out about the nature of existence, the nature of how we interact with each other. And instead they're holding it for their own will and they're justifying these sort of really irrational philosophies from it. Well, and doing that prevents you from changing yourself. The removal of metaphysics, uh, it makes things meaningless. If you can't talk about anything, if there isn't something to talk about, it literally makes all language meaningless because you are literally talking about nothing when you remove metaphysics and, and speak from an epistemology only standpoint. So they're taking unique individuals, they're creating symbolic logic equations that are general expressions. How can they make these apply to unique individuals or do they have a process of making unique individuals fit into these generalized equations used for social control. Everything is either A or non-A in a given time, in a given respect. So everything has an identity and it is what it is. I mean, I guess it's plain and simple. I mean, that, that really is common sense. Why do, why do some people get away with negating these, these ideas and, and how do they gain power from that negation in your mind? Well, benignly, some of these ideas were developed for scientific purposes. It was because there really are some, there we haven't discovered every aspect of reality, so we can only come up with the sort of probability of that which exists. So that way, they, there are these certain fallacies, these certain principles of logic that are, uh, unfortunately, at least in this case, uh, not considered. It just means that we haven't identified everything for the, all the cause and effect nature. Uh, for the law of identity to take effect. And so it requires us to sometimes use these different uh, conceptions or these different philosophies in order to develop, a, begin to develop a different understanding of how nature works so we can ultimately find out the actual constituents that make it work. But uh, sometimes, though, when you try to translate that to, the so to our social systems in the world we interact with, Obviously, it doesn't translate at all. Um, well, I mean, getting, getting to the topic of truth, and we want to find truth, and truth is valuable, and knowledge is valuable. Things that are not knowledge, things that are not substantial, these sort of irrational ideas are not valuable. So it sounds like we need a process now, or a method, to ascertain what is the truth, how do we identify knowledge, and dismiss the arbitrary. Do we have a method for this that works consistently, and how might we describe that method? Sounds like the grammar logic rhetoric method. I have to agree. I mean, it's. Should you I say your, the word? You have your grammar and you're identifying it there. Go ahead, say the word, Tony. <laughs> 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 we'll say the word and then we'll give clarification. So there's the word, the trivium. Uh, that we uh, proposed or we sort of uh, as a group it, out of our own volition and tragedy and hope, you know, kind of came around this idea uh, presented by an individual by the name of Gino Denning. And essentially it's a three stage process, a three step process called grammar, logic and rhetoric. And grammar is I have equated to a sort of perceptual to concept stage. And logic is really about Aristotelian definition, making sure uh, what something is actually is. And then our rhetoric is just how do we communicate what is, um, ultimately, like what we found out in the other two previous stages. This process, as we've already stated, you know, has certain underlying assumptions such as a metaphysical reality or realism uh, that reality actually exists involve uh, identity and non-contradictory identification uh, and that we can know it exists through our five senses so the trivium is just a three-step method really uh, of asking questions who what where why or who what when where uh, ultimately then asking why the logic stage and then asking how uh, how essentially uh, to communicate what we have essentially identified in our reality. So really it starts with our perceptions developed into our concepts, these generalized universal concepts, 
And then we test these concepts out uh, by forming definitions of these different concepts, putting in these, these definitions in the propositions, and then testing these out rationally uh, to see if there is actually a valid or invalid argument. But the real truth, the real truth takes place in the proposition or the, the definition. The definition of what something is, is ultimately where truth resides, because ultimately it's a proposition is either true or false. And that's where truth resides, what something is and not otherwise. We judge, and this is where our freedom really is expressed most fundamentally, um, besides just asking a question, our ability to uh, have a volitional free choice, to make a, have the volition to, the free will to choose, that's what I'm looking for, the free will to choose uh, what we're saying what is, and to find language about, uh, from the common aspects of what is common to all of us and how we can then communicate what is to other people. Usually, like we mentioned before, it's first and foremost probably to meet our needs for survival. When, in, when introduced with a scarcity, it seems that a top-down situation develops and predators or other people or people that with maligned intentions come in and redefine what is in order to have a certain control over the perceptions and ultimately the conceptions of what uh, has been previously established to uh, perpetuate existence. And that's where a lot of this sort of, uh, I think, these problems come in. And ultimately, the rhetoric stage or just the how stage is sort of self-explanatory, not that there are, not that that doesn't have its own set of ideas related to it. But this three-step process, I, I do have to say, uh, Kevin Cole of the Tragedy and Hope community did a fantastic job of hashing out a different history to this word, the nominal the not nomina, uh, this idea, the name of the word trivium. And uh, the man who presented it, um, Gino Denning, recently, he commented on the fact that really what he was trying to get across was formal Aristotelian definition, what something is and how, it, that, how that relates back to reality. He found the word later in his life and not really had any idea of how it related to a much larger history of control and a larger history of using logic. And this is where I come to the point that we have the power of abstraction. It's the thing most vilified today in modern philosophy, our concept formation. It's the most important thing, consciousness itself. But unfortunately, when we, this consciousness can develop a universal idea such as God, and it seems that logic can be used to justify something outside of space and time to control people. That was used by the church, and the trivium was then, you know, has a long history of that sort of use, and uh, that's just one aspect of it. And then obviously, as these skeptical arguments came in, it transformed itself into a different idea of what we now experience in the 20th century, 21st century. Uh, with these sorts of, uh, we're not quite sure what reality really is or isn't. It's just a, a perpetual chaos, and we're in relative objectivity within it. Melissa, are you going to say something? I am. I was actually back thinking about when you were talking about asking the question about why why would somebody want to convince you of about things that aren't true, and um, I think a lot of times we focus on the nebulous they up there with all the political power, or, you know, financial power, or whatever. But I think it's easy enough to see these things in our interactions with each other, or with other people in our daily lives. And, uh, and it's not so much a predatory thing or um, a power flux or differential. Sometimes it's just, um, trying to evade responsibility for self, not wanting to take responsibility for something we've done or, or something that we've said, um, which I think is a lot of the reason why many people are apt to believe in that um, external God power or authority. Um, another reason why people think that it's fun to tell their kids that this being named Santa Claus exists or the Easter Bunny you know, I think that a lot of people engage in this stuff not with vindictive or harmful intent, but simply because they are not familiar with taking full responsibility for everything they do and say and being having the vulnerability to be honest, to be sometimes mistaken, and all of these other things that for whatever reason our ego doesn't want us to embrace about ourselves. 
Well, I think a lot of people are afraid of being human. I think being human makes a lot of people fearful, and instead of taking that fear and inquiring into it to gain some knowledge and understanding and confidence from it, they maintain a recurring loop of fear. And I think that it takes a lot of courage to maintain the integrity of your mind against all these untruths that are out there. I mean, to bring it full circle for everybody, everybody's exposed to mainstream media news. News uses sentences, it uses terms, it uses periods at the end of most of their sentences. And that's the point. A valid argument has to have clear terms, true premises to be a valid argument. And those are the same things that we need to know about anything to have knowledge. You need to have clear terms. That's your grammar. You need to have true premises. That's your logic. And you need to have a valid argument. That's the rhetoric. That's the knowledge that you want to be passing around to other people. So it gets back to applying these questions to the declarative sentences of our own beliefs and that which other people are purveying as truth. You don't know the authenticity of it. They do have a mind and they are fallible because they are human beings, whether or not they are fearful of that experience or not. And it is your job to maintain the integrity of your mind. Yes, it is a little work in creating that habit. But once you create the habit, it's a lot easier. Everything in life becomes a lot easier because you're getting consistent data and you're taking actions with certainty of what the results are likely to be, as opposed to flipping a coin every day when you walk out into the world. So this idea of having clear terms, true premises, valid arguments, that's what we're seeking in life because that's what knowledge is. And surprisingly enough, to gain knowledge for ourselves, we need to make ourselves you know, uh, familiar with the identification of the individual parts, defining them, giving them names, removing the contradictions, because you might gather pieces of information, but in organizing them, you find out that two things are in direct conflict. Therefore, since nature has no contradictions, one must be true and one must be false. And that is the process of thinking to identify those contradictions and to pull them out so that you can actually get back to knowledge. So how can we then attain happiness from honing our skills of philosophy? What have we learned through this conversation tonight? Is philosophy something that is obsolete and we don't need it anymore? Or is it something that we do need and we should think more seriously about? It's a human need for survival. I love Derek's answers because he's from the South and everything is just so brief and succinct and on point and that's all that needs to be said. He's like, I could say a bunch more, but I already said it. There it is. Take it and consider it. I think that's fantastic. What do you think, Melissa? I agree with Derek and it also, it's beneficial because many things that you feel uncertain about, if you can apply a system to gain some certainty, then your fear dissipates. Uncertainty often breeds the fear that keeps us from acting or um, encourages us to act in an uninformed or hasty kind of way with bad results. So we can really do uh, ourselves a lot of favors spiritually and physically and financially and, and biologically by removing the uncertainty by striving for the truth, the good solid method for doing so. What do you think, Tony? Um, I think in the process, the fearful process of overcoming our own self-delusions, which is the ultimate goal of any logical inquiry, this sort of self-responsibility, although it is fearful, um, the, the be, having more certainty about our thoughts uh, matching up to the reality we experience ultimately showcases in our happiness through our actions will showcase later and how we feel about our results in the world and how we're relating those results to ourselves and other people. So ultimately, I, I think it, happiness comes a little later once you get over the fear. Once you find a way, a consistent, uh, make this into a consistent method and have more certainty in your life, the happiness is more implicit, just kind of happens or just is inculcated out of us. It's just something that just, it manifests uh, as a result of being more consistent in our lives with our thoughts and in our actions. I couldn't have said it any better than myself. All right, so, so that's the end of my formal questions. We can have a, a discussion amongst ourselves now about uh, you know, the relaxed nature of philosophy and the casual conversation that ensues normally between human beings when we're not doing a, a question and answer session to help people understand. I really like the, uh, the picture that you painted with this little person with the uh, generalization on top and the specifics on the bottom and the idea of a convection current 
going through this and repeating the cycle. That was that's brilliant. I like that. I, well, what I do is, uh, <laughs> as I think these things out for myself, you know, I have that uh, internal dialogue that Gatto refers to where you argue with yourself. And as I come to significant, substantial points, I would write them down on the index card. And as Tony's seen, I got stacks and stacks and boxes and boxes of these index cards. But what's useful is every now and then you'll, you'll write an idea on a card and then your mind will keep thinking about that. It's like, wait, go back. And this is this and this matches up with this. And so I actually have a couple hand-drawn diagrams, which I'll probably throw into this presentation because I'm not a good graphics person. It's just easier to, to write it out. But it communicates the idea and maybe somebody will make a more uh, aesthetic looking diagram that communicates the same idea because... I heard, uh, I think it was Brett and Corbett talking about uh, deductive logic, inductive logic, and at one point a caller called in and, and dismissed one of the two, and I thought, well, it's really interesting, and, and how does it work, and I wanted to get more you know, familiar with it, and there was actually, there's two diagrams in the Kreeft book, they're almost the exact same diagram uh, on the two pages, but basically at one point he was explaining induction and deduction and then it just clicked for me because I was like, well, I just, I drew a little person in the middle and then I started adding on other layers. And um, I do have a, a mathematical equation that, ex that describes subjective and objective reality. And uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting process that I want to take people through step by step. But before we could do that, I had to better understand these concepts for myself. So what better way to do that than to write out a bunch of questions and ask a couple superstars to, uh, to help me answer this because you guys are people who have thought for yourself for a long time and participated in various ways and various groups in the Tragedy and Hope community trying to help people, including yourself, figure this out. But you know, I think a lot more people learned from the, uh, the dialogues that we had because uh, when you have a couple people on there thinking things out, that's valid. Uh, it's very valuable to other people who are listening in uh, on those groups that couldn't participate real time because they get the benefit of many people thinking these things out and then they can think for themselves. And I think we all learned and grow, uh, have grown a lot from that initial experience and we could probably do it better the next time. But in the meantime, we had to go through that, take a period off, kind of observe these things for ourselves, kind of come back together, congeal these ideas into something coherent because just because you sit in a class and you hear all this stuff and you take a, you know, all the notes and it doesn't mean you understand. It takes a long time to kind of internalize that through an internal dialogue and to talk it forward in your head. And uh, I guess the result is if you have enough of those good ideas and you put some planning and logistics together and figure out who needs to be on the call, then you can actually make some media and help other people at least start to ask these questions for themselves, become more familiar with the definitions than we were tonight. <laughs> like we could spend a lot of time reading these definitions, but I think the important thing is to let people know that these things exist, these components of thought have been thought about, have been documented, have been tested, and those tools have been you know, obscured from our view. They do exist, people are using them, but most of the people who have problems have problems because their philosophy in life starts midstream and it is identifying you know, where you are, how to get to the shore of reality. And then once you have a connection with reality, how to maintain it daily, minutely, you know, all the time, uh, and keep your mind in sync with what's going on and how to think about that without becoming emotionally troubled or locked up with fear and panic. So I would like to thank each of you for uh, you know, hanging out tonight, helping us talk through some of these ideas. It, they sound like simple questions, but it's really hard to attach words and concepts accurate, accurately to, to describe it. So I think you guys are all brave and courageous for venturing into the unknown and you know going through the process of a little Socratic method. And you know uh, I've thought about some of these things for myself, but it's interesting to see what you guys think. I'm glad none of us found that uh, that truth is not objective or that question mark is obsolete. We still find use for it. It's still working for us. We just need more people to use it. Do you, uh, do you guys want to make any uh, closing comments or thoughts before I wrap this up? You can take this out, but I got a stick figure thing of you that you did for me. Oh, there you go. Tony's got an artifact. So that's his. Uh, that's that actually for a different fits time. in. That, well, that's a, that's a time travel theory of consciousness. Uh, yeah. But that you know what? It, it's not so crazy. Convection current of reality. Convection and it current says of the self is C negative. The square root of E over M, yeah, energy over that. matter. <laughs> I've been drawing this diagram for like six years, and now I finally understand what it means, so that's pretty cool. 
Tony, I mean, it relates to your universal. It relates to the idea of your concept in your mind, to the reality you experience, and how it kind of goes through this sort of uh, this figure eight, you know, from past to present to future. It's a really interesting model, I must admit. You know, well, you know, you're talking about the eighth estate, which is the origin of all our publications uh, seven years ago. And the eighth estate is simply the state of infinity that is the state of divinity when your mind experiences cognitive liberty. <laughs> like the Greeks say, temet noske, know yourself, know thyself. That's the secret right there. And uh, that's what we're trying to do. So I'd like to thank everyone for hanging out through this conversation. It's not a formal presentation. This is more just us trying to get a grasp of the definitions, have our minds wrap around the comparison and contrast of these ideas and let it marinate, sort it out, do a little research and uh, think for yourself. And with all that being said, if you'd like to learn more, you can visit tragedyandhope.com. You can download our podcast, The Peace Revolution, check into our films, and also avail yourself of the tools within our research and development community. In the meanwhile, thank you for tuning in and not dropping out.